It does actually, uh, it, we have a real title as well. <laughs> oh, boring. Um, and some obligatory um, University of Birmingham branding here, so before they gave me a chair. Um, and uh, this is actually not really appropriate branding because it's about antibiotic resistance and I haven't really done any antibiotic resistance work for a while. But nevertheless, this was pl plastered all over the um, tubes and train stations um, in Birmingham. And if, if you can't get me on Twitter and you can't get me on email, you'll often find me going up and down <laughs> the, the elevator at London Euston. Uh, and no one has spotted me. No one has recognised me. So. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know why. Um, okay, so on to, on to serious stuff. So I'm going to main, mainly focus on real-time sequencing and mainly talk about how genomics and open data helps um, understand pathogen evolution, pathogen spread, and um, biology. And I just, you know, you don't need to uh, have this fact reinforced, but I'm going to do it anyway, which is that genome sequences are the best possible source of information for doing this kind of work for several reasons, and this is why we have BOSC. Um, which is that they're digital, um, they're portable, i.e. we can move them around the internet and share them with people. They're universal. All the pathogens that we worry about have genomes, the exception of prion proteins, but we'll ign conveniently ignore them. But all pathogens have genomes, RNA or DNA genomes. Um, they can be compared. And critically, they are information rich. Um, comparing genome sequences even of pathogens, even over short timescales, tells us things that we are interested about in an outbreak situation. And I've just given four examples of the types of intervention or, or understanding we can get from genome sequencing from just diagnosis or identification of what is a thing. And I mentioned that example of E. coli in Germany, really trying to understand what a thing is from its genome. Source tracking, lots of examples now of using the genome to say, where did something come from? Really classic examples, the kind of canonical example in bacteria is, was the Amerithrax mailings um, just after 9-11. Uh, um, um, those spores of anthrax that were being posted out to US senators. Um, that was tracked and traced by whole genome sequencing, done very laboriously with uh, Sanger genome uh, sequencing, uh, um, but uh, nevertheless and uh, done uh, by comparing whole genomes. Uh, another high-profile example would be um, uh, the outbreak of, of cholera, uh, which continues in Haiti, um, and that was tracked, in fact, to, to Nepalese um, um, UN peacekeeping workers. Once we have genomes and an epidemic or an outbreak has been established, we can, we can use the genomes to help try and control that outbreak, and that might mean thing like, things like generating tailored diagnostics, for example, PCR primers. Um, and we can use the information to try and understand how cases relate to each other and use that to understand how the pathogen is spreading and use that to influence uh, infection control and public health measures. And we mustn't forget that we can do biology. Uh, by getting genome sequences, we can unravel uh, uh, biology. And it's a bit of a, uh, uh, these days, you know, a bit cynical every time you see genomic insights in a paper title. But the genome does provide insights quite often into uh, underlying biology, and so that's a kind of secondary use often of the data, but nevertheless is very important. So this brings us on to Ebola, and I'm going to talk about Ebola for about, about half this talk. Um, and, you know, this is a great example, uh, and a great piece of, uh, of editorial from um, Pardi Sabeti and her group at the Broad Institute, where she pointed out, it's about halfway through the Ebola um, epidemic. So you remember the Ebola epidemic lasted from 2013 actually all the way to 2016 um, and uh, claimed over 10,000 lives, so at least 30,000 cases. And around early 2015, this editorial was posted where uh, Pardis noted a few things. On the right, she noted that the epidemic curve of Ebola measured in the thousands peaked around October 2014. Uh, you can see up to almost 7,000 cases expected uh, at that time. And above that, the, the chart above shows the availability of sequencing data for that same time period. And you'll notice um, there are some genome sequences from the start of the epidemic, and there are some from a bit later on, at the end of 2014, early 2015. And you'll notice a big gap, a big gap where there is no genome sequence data available. Um, why is there no genome sequence available? Um, is it because actually we know We've got some genome sequences from Ebola. It's no longer interesting. They're all going to be the same anyway. What's the point? Is it that, um, well, actually, it's really quite difficult to do genome sequencing in an ongoing Ebola epidemic in West Africa? Yes, it is difficult to do. 
Um, actually, those are not reasons. The reasons that there were no genome sequencing uh, data is because actually people hadn't published them yet. The, the data was actually already generated. It was not actually available at this point pending uh, formal publication. And she mentions quite rightly that the power of these massive data sets to combat epidemics will be realized only if the data is shared widely and as quickly as possible and no good guidelines are available to, to ensure that this happens. There are actually very good practical reasons, though, why genome sequence data might not be available from the epidemic, which is that we don't have, we didn't have sequences in West Africa. And if you um, are involved in the outbreak response and you want to send a package of Ebola-infected blood to the University of Birmingham, let's say, don't send it to us, no. <laughs> to the Broad Institute or... or, or <laughs> <laughs> What you'll find is that DH, you know, DHL, FedEx, I'm not singling out DHL, um, are not that helpful at the best of times, right? <laughs> but you'll find an epidemic situation, they're, ex they're extremely unhelpful. No one really wants to um, collect these um, packages of potentially lethal virus and, and uh, ship them from one place to another. And they charge a very large amount of money uh, to do it um, uh, as a consequence. So there's these, these, these kind of um, issues. Um, and the other issues are, are that if you try and do it in country, it's really difficult to do because there's no sequences. So, you know, you've got this problem of how do you get a, se a sample to a sequencer so you can get some genome data quickly enough to inform the response. And, of course, we had the answer to that problem. Well, so, so I was not, I'm not a virologist, wasn't then, still am not. But we knew the answer to this problem immediately, which is that we take the sequences to the samples. And we knew what, what sequencer we would take. We would take an Oxford nanopore minime. Why would we take that? Because they're effectively free. Um, you, you don't pay for the instrument, you pay for the reagents. They are exceptionally portable. I didn't bring one with me, stupidly, but they do fit in your pocket. Um, and that gives you the ability to take a sequencer to West Africa or wherever you want to sequence very rapidly. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of details of Oxford Nanopore because that's a whole different talk other than to say it's uh, a real-time instrument that's important for this kind of work. Real-time in this case means as you sequence a DNA strand, that's what's happening in this movie, a single strand of DNA is being sequenced, initially the template strand followed by the complement strand in this, uh, in this situation. Um, actually, no, this is probably 1D, sequ this is 1D sequencing, so it's just a template strand. It's going through a, a, a pore. The, the presence of that molecule in the pore disrupts an electrical current signal. That current signal has been uh, generated by a flow of, of ions uh, from one side of a biological membrane to the other and detected with a very, very sensitive electrical current detector. Um, and so what that means is every time a DNA strand is read, a file is written out onto your laptop, because this is controlled through your laptop. A new file is, is, is written, and that file contains the DNA it sequence information uh, for that uh, particular read. So it's, got a, it's a real-time platform, it's a single molecule. You're at, you are looking at the electrical current signal that's been generated from a single molecule of DNA going through a pore. And uh, in the top left, just to illustrate the fact that this is massively parallel or kind of reasonably parallel, uh, you have 2,000 of these pores up to with 500 of them being read um, at a time. So that's how the system works. Um, and we'd played with Minion. Um, we got it in mid-2014, um, and we were starting to think about Ebola in kind of, after that editorial came out, so kind of in, in kind of mid-2015, we started thinking about, uh, sorry, in early, in early 2015, we started thinking about the possibilities, and we figured, you know, why can't you just take the sequencer out and do some sequencing? How hard can that be? I wouldn't know how hard that could be. Um, and uh, crucially, we didn't actually know what you had to take to go and do sequencing um, in the field. So, th so the, the way that we address this problem is um, cleared uh, Josh's quite messy desk. So this is Josh Quick, who's uh, uh, just finishing his PhD uh, uh, with me. Josh cleared down his, his bench space and brought in equipment one by one um, to try and go through the protocol of sequencing, in this case, amplicons. We're doing RT-PCR. Uh, then PCR, and then we're getting amplicons to sequence um, of Ebola. And he brought in all the bits of equipment that you needed, and when you got through the protocol, whatever was left on the desk was the stuff that would go to West Africa. Um, and you can see it's a reasonably um, 
minimal uh, set of equipment. We've got um, actually the biggest bit of equipment you can see. If you're a lab person, you'll recognize as a thermocycler. In that hard case, there's a qubit for, for doing DNA quantification. And you've got the reagents that have to be kept. Some have to be kept frozen. Some have to be kept uh, at fridge temperature. And uh, that's the kit that you need. And when you put it all in a bag um, and you take it down to Heathrow, uh, that's all you need to take to do sequencing in the field. Um, and in fact, that top bag, the rucksack, is just full of Josh's pants and socks, entirely optional for sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's less, it's less than that. Now, I have to just say, um, I do like to call out, so, it, so Josh, so I say, I didn't go to Africa, Josh went to Africa, he, he got permission from the university, from, um, from this was work, work done with Public Health England, got permission from his girlfriend and his mum, um, and uh, um, he went down to Heathrow to fly to Conakry, the capital of Guinea, via Charles de Gaulle, and uh, even though everyone on that flight that was helping, this was, this was in April 2015, uh, everyone was helping with the outbreak response. Um, they still charged us for excess baggage, which I thought was very... Ba bastards, thank you. Which I thought, absolutely. So, don't fly Air France. Okay. So, so at the other end, um, you know, so this is a real worry. So, you know, Josh probably won't mind me saying that he's not actually... He is quite forgetful. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're really kind of worried, is he going to get there and he's going to unpack the suitcase and he's forgotten the one little reagent that you need to make this work. He's going to have to fly back with his tail between his legs. We're all going to look like idiots and, um, and, and that will be the end of the story. Luckily, that's not what happened. And in fact, within 48 hours of getting in the lab, and this is a temporary lab in Donka Hospital in Conakry, um, and he's uh, standing there with Dr. Masuma working on the vaccine trial, and Miles Carroll from Public Health England and EM Labs. Um, he managed to get some samples, which are deactivated, just point that out, the deactivated RNA samples, amplify them, put them on the, on the minine and get sequencing. And that was done within 48 hours. And that's notable not just because we did it on the minine, but that's notable for doing sequencing, right? Because if you try setting up any sequencing instrument within 48 hours and get results, I, I, you'll find it very difficult. So we were delighted that, that this seemed to be working. Um, we, we did some test sequencing. We did about, I think, about 14 genomes over the period of, of two weeks. And, and the process was Josh would do the sequencing, upload the data via a mobile phone connection, quite laborious process. We, I would analyze it in Birmingham. Um, and we would release, we would, we would generate these molecular phylogenetic results and we'd give them back to the national coordination and WHO. And to our surprise, actually, because we didn't really know how this would, what the reaction would be to this, to this data, um, they really, really loved it. So they really loved the idea of getting this genome uh, data. And in fact, even though we had a, only a few genome sequences early on, we could already tell that, that the, the, the outbreak in Guinea had, had diversified into two quite, quite different lineages at that point, meaning you could immediately start to make some epidemiological inferences. So WHO got behind it, the National Coordination in Guinea uh, were very supportive and they built us several genome centers. Um, this is our most fancy one in Nongo. Uh, um, and uh, we trained uh, a, quite a team of volunteers uh, from Europe and from uh, 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 local Guinean scientists, Joseph and Raymond, so Raymond pictured here. And we established this principle of real-time genomic sequencing um, to go all the way to hopefully the end, to the end of the uh, epidemic, which would hopefully be soon. And the key thing here that makes this different from other genomic investigations is that this is a, a real-time prospective investigation. Um, and not only is it prospective, it's super, super quick. And so our view was that the faster you can generate the data, the more utility it has for public health response. There's no point mapping out the outbreak uh, a year after it's finished, but the quicker you can do it, the more it relates to patients that are actively being treated and are actively being followed in terms of case uh, 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 epidemiology on the ground, the more useful the data will be. So on the left, we can show that relationship between samples being collected from patients in red, and this could be from anywhere in Guinea, not just uh, near where we were located, and uh, when the sample was actually sequenced um, in blue. And in many cases, that was in less than 48 hours, and often within uh, a week. And sometimes where you see very long gaps, that reflects us wanting to fill in some missing links um, in, the, in the tree. Um, 
And in a sense, we were fortunate because we, we were responding at the point where we were on the downslope of the epidemic curve, so not claiming that we, that we fixed the Ebola epidemic at all. Um, and uh, the nice thing about that was that the number of cases that were coming through were the kind of numbers where we could get good coverage of the outbreak. So um, from about May, we were getting at least 50% of all new cases in country being sequenced. And that's critical because, you know, as with everything, sampling is absolutely vital. If you're sampling not well in the country or not enough cases, you don't have power for, for your um, investigation. Now, this was a team effort, and this was a huge team effort in Guinea, and there was a second team effort going on in Sierra Leone, um, led by a virologist from Cambridge, Ian Goodfellow, who I didn't know at all at the time. And uh, this is by way of contrast. Um, this is what you need to do if you want to set up a more traditional benchtop instrument in the field. Um, this is an iron torrent um, um, instrument. And, you know, Ian spent a lot, lot of money on this, uh, but, you know, serious effort to get an iron torrent up and running um, in a tent um, and around the same time that we set up um, our sequencing. And this was great. I mean, this is absolutely vital because now we have coverage of two of the main countries that are involved in the epidemic, Liberia um, being the third. And um, we started trying to work out a process of sharing this data. So we shared the data uh, with the WHO and we shared it with the National Coordination. Um, and a lot of the coordination was done by uh, a kind of trusted independent partner who, that both Ian and myself knew, Andrew Rambo from the University of Edinburgh. And Andrew had this remarkable ability to be able to see all of the group's data that were generating either in prospectively like us uh, or retrospectively. And he had all of these data sets. He's the guy that made Beast. And he had the ability to act as a kind of broker or, or a central point for these data sets. And uh, this was very early on in the process, early June, as an email saying he's, he'd looked at Ian's data, he looked at our data, and did you know that there is a considerable evidence of, of back and forth transmission between for a carrier prefecture in Guinea, which is uh, on the border of Sierra Leone and Cambria district. Um, and that was, that wouldn't, be completely surprising. The borders in that part of West Africa are reasonably porous, but at the same time, that's quite a politically charged finding because that means that you've actually, your whatever border control efforts are, are put in place are not sufficient to stop Ebola jumping between uh, countries. And that was very clear evidence that we could give to the WHO that this was indeed um, a problem. And uh, when we put data together, um, it's easy uh, uh, to identify. So, for example, here, where we have cases that are extremely closely related between green ones from, from Guinea and purple ones from Sierra Leone, and again down here, examples of that. And this is just completely obvious to you guys, I'm sure, but you know, if you don't integrate these data sets, you cannot find this information out. It's, it's completely obvious, but just to, to, if we gray out all of the points apart from the Guinea sequences and, and we put that on our tree and we look at the tree of Sierra Leone, how are you going to find links between two countries unless you put them in the same place? And um, this got us thinking, well, really, um, this, this is a process that needs to happen and needs to be happening in real time. Um, as well. So Andrew, at this point, uh, it's kind of in June time, introduced me to um, uh, Trevor Bedford uh, and Richard Nayer, who are uh, kind of visualization gods who work on a, a site called Next Strain. Uh, it was called Next Flu at the time because it was really focused on flu. They'd be doing this idea of aggregating data and presenting it in an attractive way. Um, um, through their next flu site. And I said at the conference to, to Richard, we need this for Ebola. It's absolutely cr uh, crucial. We'll put the data up on GitHub. You can suck it in and, and display it, and we'll be able to find out interesting things. And of course, they, they immediately they said that we'd had that idea already, in fact, and let's, you know, we're going to do it. So this, this website came up incredibly quickly, and we started to be able to, to feed data via GitHub um, um, onto this uh, website. And, you know, it, it really did enable, it enabled several things. It enabled us to start viewing data in context. Um, and, you know, it also gave us an incredibly powerful tool to express viral evolution 
in an outbreak? Because I think, you know, th th people get very confused about viral evolution in an outbreak. And one of the things that is very poorly understood, for example, is the effect of mutation rate. So a lot of focus on mutation rate in 2014. Oh, the mutation rate's very high. Ebola's going to suddenly become airborne. Oh, it's very low. We don't need to worry. None of those things are really important. Um, the important things um, are to understand the phylogenetic relationships between uh, um, cases. In fact, the Ebola uh, evolutionary rate was very, very similar to, to that had been seen in previous um, outbreaks. So the important thing here is that all the cases, so you know, 30,000 plus cases uh, um, came from an, you know, a single, are uh, related by a single common ancestor down at the root of the tree. Um, that relate, that's our putative index case. And, and we think through epidemiological studies, we know that who the index case was. It was a toddler playing around a burnt out tree um, in Gwekadu, the for, uh, forested region of Guinea. And that was probably some contact, maybe with, with, directly or indirectly, with the, the source population, most likely bats. We still don't really know for sure um, um, how Ebola circulates in animal populations. But that initial spillover event resulted in this tree, this diversity, this um, huge um, um, amount of, well, relatively large amount of genetic diversity that, that accumulated over the period of looking at about two years here. And what you can see is very early on, actually, um, it, it diversified into two different lineages. This lineage here um, was associated with a particular mutation that, that is speculated to have been uh, uh, increased uh, virulence, and that's not entirely clear if that's true. Um, but then what you see is this diversification into different lineages, sub-lineages, clades, uh, that are very geographically um, clustered. So, so you see in Sierra Leone, in purple, you see these clades being quite... Um, uh, 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 being, being geographically clustered. This is the cluster in Liberia. Here's some uh, uh, Guinea sequencing. And that, that is really, really informative for a bunch of different reasons. But the, the, the most actionable bit of information you can give an epidemiologist is simply, well, if you have a case from this lineage, let's say, um, and a case from this lineage, and you speculate that they're related, that one person transmitted to the other person, you can actually say, with with complete surety that those cases are not related. There's no way that you can have that path, that completely unique path of quite neutral evolution um, happening multiple times by chance. So, you know, cases that are close together in this tree may be related, but ones that are in different clades are effectively can't be related. And that gives you something that you can actually use in outbreak response. And so, the, real, the strength of this work, I think, was that we managed to do this. We managed to, 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 to relay this information um, to the WHO, to national coordination, prepare reports. And after the reports were prepared and after the information was processed, we were able to put this very quickly onto GitHub um, for scientists uh, to look at. So other than tra cross-border transmissions, we were able to identify links between patients. And that was really important for epidemiologists, particularly in situations where they couldn't access that patient population to ask questions. A lot of epidemiology relies on um, finding patients that are, are, are new, newly diagnosed and saying, who have you had contact with, and going and following up those contacts. Often that contact information was difficult or impossible to get, and often communities made it, uh, uh, were not receptive to, um, to that kind of traditional epidemiology. So this gives an e additional extra source of information about chains of transmission. Later on, Ebola kind of w uh, waned around September, October um, 2015, but, but actually multiple cases of Ebola were, were found through flare-ups um, in late 2015 and early uh, 2016. And with the genome data, access rapidly, you could immediately determine whether a flare-up was likely to be uh, a hidden chain of transmission that had been circulating, that had been missed, um, a new animal introduction, new spillover. People were always worried about that, even though it seemed unlikely to, for that to be the case. But if there was a six-month gap in, in Guinea between uh, cases uh, from October 2015 and March 2016, well, who's to say that isn't a new animal introduction? You can't actually know. The genome data will tell you that uh, very confidently. And one of the most surprising findings from this genome work was um, a very clear demonstration of a transmission from a survivor uh, who had been infected in 2014, survived, um, apparently not been too unwell, um, and uh, the new cases of Ebola 
that cropped up in March 2016 that caused a, a cluster of about 10 or 20 cases and actually resulted in another cross-border transmission into Liberia. And in fact, the genome data could identify with precision that survivor um, from a particular village who was also identified by the epidemiologist as a likely source. That survivor was tested, found to have quite high levels of Ebola in their semen, um, and uh, it was very, very clear that that, that, that survivor had... Um, uh, managed to generate a new transmission chain. Um, the epidemiology information on its own wouldn't have been enough there. The genomes on its own wouldn't, probably wouldn't have been enough because people would say, well, there's some kind of technical artifact here or something. But in fact, uh, together, it all made sense. And that's an example of a data set you wouldn't want to release immediately. That's what I met referenced in, in the panel discussion. So put it all together, um, very talented phylogeographer worked for um, uh, Andrew Rambo at the time, Gittis Dudas put this animation together, recapitulating the entire outbreak from 1,600 genome sequences that were generated from various groups across this work, across the, the course of the ep epidemic. Was it? Yeah, music, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. So we're coming to, to 2015, middle of 2015 at this point. Now what kind of should jump, a few things should jump out of you about that visualization, apart from the fact that it's a very cool visualization. Um, what should jump out of you is that you can see a focus of infection around urban areas. So we're looking at Freetown, Conakry, Monrovia. But what you should have noticed is there were a huge number of exports from places, from local uh, um, sub-outbreaks to new places which seeded a new outbreak. Um, and you can see those transmissions are quite large distances sometimes, which, which reflects the kind of the, reflects modern Africa and, and the mobility. And the important thing there is, if you are dealing with, with Ebola and you just say, well, I've just got this big outbreak, it's, quite, it's difficult to understand how you're going to tackle it. But if you look at it like this, you say, well, actually, I haven't got an outbreak. I've got about eight different outbreaks going on, and I've got frequent transmissions um, from urban centres into the countryside. And one of the last examples was a transmission from uh, this area up into uh, Bokeh, which is on, on, the, um, on the border of Guinea-Bissau, one of the poorest, I think, the poorest healthcare system in the world. And just, you can see it's just chance that stops, that stops Ebola getting into Guinea-Bissau or into a neighboring country and starting uh, uh, more cases. So it's, this is a remarkable visualization, but this is done in retrospect. So we want to be able to generate this uh, data uh, prospectively, that's Gitis. Um, so this is the idea now. So the idea is we've got the technology, um, we've got some kind of system, um, but you know, we deployed very late um, into country, as, as did Ian, as did others. Um, could we change the epidemic curve, or could we help change the epidemic curve working with, with, with the other teams if we could deploy sequencing earlier? And I like this phrase from Peter Piot, which is outbreaks are inevitable. We're always going to get these outbreaks, these spillover events. But an epidemic is not inevitable. Pandemic should be preventable. You know, think HIV, you know, if you go back, it didn't exist in human populations, and now it's endemic. You know, uh, at each point, if you, can, if you can make an intervention, you can, you can stop that chain of outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, endemicity. And that's, that's the kind of idea. How long have I got? Sorry. Or oh, approximately. Okay, cool. Okay. So I'm going to talk very briefly about Zika because we finished the Ebola work. It was great. I mean, the work was great. We really, uh, we thought we'd done something important. And uh, before we knew what was going on, I think our paper came out in February 2016, WHO um, declared a public health emergency of international concern associated with Zika. And um, Zika it w was not something that was well known. Um, it, it probably only 16 cases of Zika actually reported before 2007. And suddenly, uh, we seem to have an epidemic in Brazil in summer 2015, 
and then an associated rise in microcephaly cases um, 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 associated uh, or correlated with, with those cases. And um, again, same problem, exactly the same problem as Ebola. Um, this, some modeling that was done in Nature Microbiology predicted something like 37 million cases of Zika in Brazil um, by um, uh, early 2016. 10 genomes. 10 genomes. Why only 10 genomes? 37 million cases. Remarkable. Reasons are slightly different, as I'll, I'll go into, um, but we were kind of, you know, we were riding high, I guess, at that point from, from the Ebola work, and uh, uh, the MRC and the Wellcome Trust put out a call for, for grants for, for rapid emergency funding, which we applied for. And the most remarkable thing about that is that we got our grant funding within a fortnight of writing the application. And anyone that's written a grant will know that that's good. Um, <laughs> But it did mean that we had to act very quickly and do something. So this was a collaboration um, um, with uh, three centers in Brazil, University of Sao Paulo, uh, Fio Cruz, and the Institute uh, of Andres Chagas. And our idea here was to reuse a, a lab on a bus um, as a kind of portable mobile genomic sequencing lab, and we would go on a road trip. And the idea would be a bit like Top Gear, but with less blokey misogyny and racism. <laughs> So we would, go down, we would go down from Natal, down to Salvador, and we'd stop off at public health labs, working with the Brazilian Ministry of Health, and we would test samples for Zika, and we would sequence them, and we would try and work out what is going on with Zika. And uh, that's what we did. So some, some screenshots here, and uh, I went this time, uh, after considerable criticism over the Ebola work, I went along, um, and uh, here's us uh, um, uh, working in labs, um, um, uh, Bruno and Pollyanna, entomologists working in the field collecting mosquitoes, uh, Louise and uh, Marcio uh, in the lessons here, and there's me doing bioinformatics on a bus, uh, very sweaty. And everyone says oh, I was watching Game of Thrones, but I wasn't. I was doing genome analysis, <laughs> and uh, it's very sweaty. Just like here, it was very sweaty because the aircon wasn't working properly because the aircon had previously been set on fire um, a few days earlier. So that's what's going on there. And uh, the difference between this and the Ebola work was that at this point, a, a local base caller had been made available from Oxford Nanopore, so we didn't have to upload the data, and we could actually analyze the data in the field. It was quite slow, and that laptop got very hot, and actually my MacBook was destroyed in the process of this work because it overheated. But nevertheless, we could tell um, that we had uh, genome sequence cells. I'm going to skip over this a little bit, but just to say we knew it was going to be quite difficult to do Zika sequencing, and we knew that we were going to have to use PCR, um, and uh, the reason we use PCR is because we knew that, that, that the sample was going to be relatively low in Zika virus and relatively high in human genome. So we'd, we'd, we'd figured this out in April before the, before the trip, that it was going to be difficult, and we designed this PCR scheme, and we took it on the, on the road trip, and we did the sequencing, and we analyzed the data on the bus, and we were very disappointed to find that the results were terrible. Um, the results were terrible because only eight genomes had more than 50% of the genome actually covered by reads. Very, very disappointing. The PCR scheme did not work well um, at all. It worked okay at home um, on isolates, and it worked all right in, in University of Sao Paulo on an isolate, but it didn't work on clinical samples. And the reason for that is pretty clear. Um, there's very, very, very little Zika in a, clinic, in a typical cl clinical sample. Um, the median here is about a CT of 36. That means you need to do 36 cycles of PCR before you get positive. That translates to a handful of viral genome copies in your, in your sample per, per mil. And, and that just means PCR is very difficult to do. Well, it means PCR is, is, is a little bit harder to do. It means things like metagenomics. So this was a, a table from um, Christian Anderson where he tries to do metagenomics on Zika. didn't work um, at all. So with these CTs of 36, you've got no Zika reads at all. With a CT of 34, you've got 60 Zika reads. Enough to detect it in that case, but not enough to actually um, get phylogenetically informative information. So this is where the open science bit comes in. We came home. I mean, it was a great experience. We drank a lot of Kuiperinius. We had a good time. We did do a lot of mosquito sampling and qPCR, which was valuable. Uh, we made great collaborations, but we didn't have the genomes that we wanted to answer the question, which was really you know, where, where did Zika come from and, and how was it spreading? And so Josh spent um, the next month um, in the labs, as Josh Quick again, and uh, eventually just figured out, you know, this is kind of fairly basic, 
you know, uh, you're going to need much more stringent primers with much higher melting uh, temperatures to get this to work. And he designed a new scheme, which we put on our GitHub uh, repository. And this was, um, I think, something like July, middle of July. And this is where the open science kicks in. So um, less than two weeks later, an email from um, Nathan Grubau, and, uh, who works uh, with Christian Anderson at the Scripps Institute, saying, we're also trying and struggling to sequence Zika. We've got sequences from Florida. Um, we've tried approaches, but just don't really seem to work. I've seen your protocol online. going to try it out. And he asked us a few questions. I, I'm assuming the 65 centigrade annealing step is for 15 minutes. There's a typo. It's 15 sec. Did you mean 15 seconds? We didn't actually. We did mean 15 minutes. That's probably a bit long, but, but it was important to have a long annealing step. So we replied to them. Um, a month later, there's a blog post on their website saying, um, talking about the difficulties they were having sequencing Zika and announcing that um, they tried our protocol and it worked brilliantly well and they've adapted it for the Illumina platform. And here's a link to their protocol, um, um, uh, uh, which they hosted, um, I think, on, on Google Docs. Um, so that was great. And so they managed to get the protocol to work and they adapted it for Illumina. It was then picked up by Pardis Sabeti at the Broad Institute took that protocol and used it um, to generate genome sequences uh, for their project. And suddenly, we had about 150 genomes, maybe more, that we could make a phylogenetic analysis um, from. This got all packaged up. So this is a, a, a bit of software that, that, that Josh uh, made with, with Andy Smith, and it was styled here by Ollie Pibus uh, into Primal Scheme. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're into uh, British indie, you'll recognize Screamadelica. Um, and this is a system where anyone can generate these types of primer schemes for their pathogen of interest. We have it working for Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, Ebola. That's both online and it's also available uh, in source form if you want it. And we also developed a Docker pipeline. Um, and, uh, um, and the important thing here was that we did actually need to analyze this data on Windows, which is the most common Minion laptop um, on Mac and on PC. So actually Docker in this case was not just us being fancy, but actually was important to have it working. And uh, we have this very simple pipeline that will take uh, a Minion data generated with these schemes and spit out the consensus sequences and all of the QC and everything you need uh, to use the information. I'm getting my one minute warning. So just to, to, to kind of finish up the Zika story, we, by combining these data sets, and these, all, all the three papers got published back to back in Nature, but they were in BioArchive some months before, um, and uh, we were able to tell a good story about, about, um, about Zika. And, and the key message here was that Zika was indeed missed it was indeed circulating in Brazil a long time before it was uh, first detected. Hit this dotted line is the point where the first clinically confirmed case was. And through a, a time-resolved phylogenetic analysis, uh, you can actually see uh, um, the, 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 the ancestor, um, the, the presumed importation into somewhere in the Americas occurred back in 2013 and uh, very likely ended up in Brazil, in northeast Brazil, where we were sampling um, as early as, um, as kind of um, uh, the start of 2014. And this result was confirmed to looking at other areas. We looked at South America outside Brazil. Um, our confidence interval for when Zika was introduced, again, a full year or more before the first case, Central, Central America and the Caribbean, uh, very, very similar uh, situations. And this really just emphasizes the gap in our surveillance. Our, our surveillance is not good until we find some big important finding like a, a, a surge in cases of microcephaly. We did not know about millions of cases uh, until then. So this is what we want to uh, sort out. So because I've only got a minute, I'm going to skip over this, but other than to say that, that this is becoming routine now. We're doing it on yellow fever. There's an ongoing outbreak of yellow fever in Brazil. And the important thing is it doesn't require Josh or myself to get involved anymore. This is, this is something that our Brazilian collaborators um, um, can do using the protocols that we've developed. And uh, a lot of these findings get posted on a website called Virological uh, in advance. Um, and I'm going to skip over this other than to say, doesn't everything I said, if you thought it was interesting, but you say, well, I, it's interesting, but I don't really like viruses. They're quite boring, even though I must have convinced you they're not. You can do this on bacteria. So we've assembled whole genomes in the field complete genomes using a 15-minute library prep protocol from isolates um, in the field. 
Um, and uh, the MinEye and, and the Nanopore platform is now becoming um, applicable to larger eukaryotic genome and particularly uh, for assembly. So a new protocol that we've uh, recently uh, released is our Ultra Reads protocol. That's the protocol of generating reads up to a megabase on the Nanopore instrument. So um, our record is somewhere around 886 uh, KB, a single read. That means you can assemble E. coli in eight reads. That doesn't even need an assembler, really. Okay. <laughs> So we're, we're getting into this uh, post kind of post assembly future or kind of trivial uh, assembly future, and uh, to mention that we have now um, sequenced a whole human genome. It took quite a long time. It took 40 flow cells. Uh, it took several months. Um, it took even longer to analyse the data. Sergey's in the audience. He assembled the data, but we do think that this platform will be compatible with whole genome assembly, and therefore that means you may be able to do it near the patient. You may be able to do it in the field um, in the near future. So everything that I've said about viruses, apply it to your favorite organism. It may soon be possible. So uh, this is the final slide, I promise. Um, um, you know, at the moment, now kind of portable nanopore sequencing has become a thing. Everyone's doing it. Um, I, think we were, we, we, I think we trailblazed it, but, but now uh, um, there are many places you can sequence, and this is channeling Dr. Seuss. Um, on a boat, uh, in a, uh, out um, uh, on a, uh, with a goat out there, uh, looking, uh, doing plant identification on a plane. That was Josh, thankfully not on United Airlines. Um, on a tr uh, down a mine, uh, up at the Arctic and the Antarctic, and even uh, in outer space. And so um, this is happening. Something you need to be aware of, and it completely is relevant to this idea of open data. Uh, and sharing. If sequencing becomes ubiquitous, everyone's going to be doing it. There's going to be data coming out of our ears. We are not ready for this. Maybe we can get ready for this for pathogen sharing with a lot of effort, but we're not ready for this in terms of the broader implications um, for science and for, uh, for society. And I think these were the points that came out in the panel discussion already. We're going to need some trust and some goodwill to make these sharing systems uh, work uh, to, to balance all of the competing demands. I am going to finish. We're hiring. Uh, come and see me if you want a job. And uh, thank you to everyone that was involved in the work. Thank you very much.